Okay. And it looks like we are live. Uh, thank you and welcome all. We're really happy you could join us today for another NAF Research and Tech talk series. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Nick Menar. I'm Director of Research and Reporting at NAF. And it's really my pleasure to be hosting this talk today and to introduce the NAF network to Dr. Catherine Shields, who is a wonderful researcher in the CTE and education field and someone I've been lucky enough to get to know over the last 10 months or so. Uh, just a reminder, uh, the purpose of these talks is to provide a unique opportunity to the NAF network, to NAF staff, and just generally to friends of the NAF network so that you can hear from experts conducting research in many important areas of education-related scholarship. I'm so thrilled that with all the competitions for your time, you were able to make calendar space for us and that you decided to join us today in this research talk. Uh, as folks trickle in on YouTube, if you could, uh, please share who you are, introduce yourself, um, say hi in the chat, tell us where you're coming from today and uh, what school or organization you're with, uh, just so that we can all get to know each other a little better. Uh, before we start with the talk, I'd like to do a little light house camping just before we get rolling. A uh, quick reminder that if you have to leave early or if you want to watch this talk again later or share it with a friend, we are recording the talk and a full recording will be available after the event on our NAF Research and Tech page on LinkedIn. So if you go onto LinkedIn and you just follow NAF Research and Tech, you'll see this link on there following the event. Um, so give us a follow and check us out. Um, this is just one destination where we're going to post the talk after the uh, event. We'll also distribute the talk through various other social media channels as well. Oh, looks like some folks are already introducing themselves on the chat. So we're looking forward to that and the rest of the talk. Okay. And now let me introduce our speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Catherine Shields. Uh, she is a research scientist at Education Development Center, and she specializes in college and career readiness and success. Her current work includes studying career academies and work-based learning, evaluating the effects of dual enrollment programs, assessing skills gained through hands-on STEM project-based learning, and supporting state policy decision-making for high school graduation pathways. Uh, Dr. Shields holds an EDM from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and a PhD from the Lynch School of Education and Human Development in Boston College. I'm thrilled, I'm actually really thrilled that she accepted my invitation to speak with all of you today. And uh, just a quick note before I hand over the microphone, I encourage you to pose questions in the chat while Dr. Shields is giving her talk. We're actually going to have two breaks for Q&A during the talk today. so the more audience participation, the better. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna disappear and hand the mic over to Dr. Catherine Shields. Catherine. Great, thank you, Nick. And thank you so much for this chance to talk with all of you today um, and share our team's work. Because really we do what we do because we wanna create uh, research that's useful for you, the educators in the field. So it's always really great to be able to have a conversation like this. Um, so I wanted to start by just briefly um, thanking um, our research team who are named here at Education Development Center and also acknowledging our partner district where we conducted the research that I'm going to share with you today. Um, that's Elk Grove Unified School District in Northern California. And um, I believe Sue Hubbard, who's a, a program specialist in their college and career options group, um, may be on the line and in the chat as well today. Um, many teachers and students shared generously of their time to make this research possible. And I also want to thank uh, our funder, the Institute for Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education and all the great support um, that they have shown for CTE research. So as Nick mentioned today, what I'll do is start by giving an introduction to what the study is about and how it was set up. Um, and I'll talk about two pieces of our findings. Um, I'll start by sharing some information about equ equity and access to career academies and who is accessing them in this district. Then we'll pause for some Q&A about that topic. Uh, and then I'll dive into our main research question with this study, which was to look at do career academy students have different outcomes than other types of CTE students? 
and then we'll go back to some Q and A time um, at that point at the end. But um, as Nick said, feel, please, please feel free to type a, a comment or a question in the chat at any point. And if it's something where Nick can flag me, you know, as I'm talking, I'm happy to pause and answer questions as we go as well. So to give you a quick sense of sort of the study overall and where we were doing the work. Um, so for context, um, Elk Grove is a very large school district um, serving you know, 20,000 students just in their high schools. Um, and they have a really long and rich history of offering career academies and other types of career technical education. So they have uh, pocket career academies within each of their nine comprehensive high schools. Um, and they also offer a number of industry sector pathways for students. So they have decades of experience kind of doing that kind of work. Um, and it's also a very diverse uh, district on a number of dimensions. So in terms of race, ethnicity of the student body, um, and also geographically, it ranges from you know, agricultural rural areas within their catchment area to also more urban and suburban areas. So it was a really great place uh, to work with understanding the, the variety of experiences that students have um, with career and technical education. Um, so this, to give you a sense of sort of what the, how the study was set up and what we were trying to look at, um, a, there is a lot of research or a grow, really a growing body of rigorous research that's starting to show the kinds of outcomes that career academies can have for students. Um, and there's some evidence that there's positive effects for students um, graduating high school, enrolling in college, um, on their earnings and their employment later in life. Um, but there, there is not as much understanding of kind of what could be the features of an academy that might be actually making that difference. Um, so what we wanted to do was to try to kind of peel back some of the layers and understand what is it about an academy that might be different from simply taking career technical education courses. So we took the opportunity in this district that has this variety of different ways of offering CTE to make that comparison. So uh, within this district, students have a choice when they come to high school. Um, they can enroll in a career academy, um, as shown in the dark black box on your screen. Um, and then they also have other choices. They can take a, a sequence of three related courses that are preparing them for a particular industry sector, um, or they can dabble and take electives. They can try something out that's not necessarily part of a sequence, but is, is an elective that introduces them to a particular sector. So for much of the uh, analysis that I'm gonna share with you today, what we're really comparing here are those academy students to any other student who is taking CTE in some other form. Um, what we're not comparing to is non-CTE students. So just to be clear about, about what uh, we're talking about here. Um, so in terms of the uh, sample that we were working with, um, the, this was a group of students who were a cohort who were first time CTE students in either grade nine or 10 in the 2014-15 school year. So it was close to 4,000 students in that cohort. Um, and we used uh, a number of sources of quantitative data from the district. So we had CTE course enrollment data, um, student demographic characteristics, and various measures of test scores and GPA and um, attendance suspensions, that kind of thing. Um, and we also, for qualitative analysis, we wanted to, this is really a mixed method study. So we wanted to bring together both what we could learn from a, a quantitative perspective with sort of understanding what the experience of the career academy was like and what the experience of CTE was like for students. Um, so we also selected four of the schools um, and went and talked in more depth with people in four of the career academies in, in those schools. Um, for that process, we talked to 60 students. Um, we had focus groups with career academy students and also with um, non-academy CTE students um, who, were, who were in some of the same courses so that we could kind of tease out what were the differences in those experiences. And then we also interviewed, uh, had focus groups with 28 um, technical and also academic teachers who were associated with the career academies in those programs and a number of uh, school administrators and sector coaches in those schools. So kind of trying to put together the pieces of a picture of, of what those experiences were like. And so for the qualitative data, we were using more of um, coding of transcripts and writing memos to kind of synthesize and understand the themes that came out of that. And I'll come back a little bit later and talk about the um, quantitative methods that we used um, when I get to the second section of the talk. So 
to start into the, the first piece here, um, as we got started on the study, one of the first things we wanted to do was to look at the profiles of the students in these two groups who were enrolling in a career academy and students who chose a different um, CTE experience. Um, because, you know, as you know, historically, there had been some kind of tendencies for um, some tracking of students into vocational technical education. Um, and there was a time when it was seen as kind of a less than pathway. Um, but as you know, with groups like yourselves at NAF, um, who are really pursuing a more modern career academy approach that's really preparing students to have choices for college and or career, um, there can be a really different kind of dynamic that happens in some districts where uh, more advantaged families are excited to enroll their kids in a career academy. And um, so you can end up with equity issues in terms of sort of historically career academies were an attempt to kind of help keep students engaged with school um, who might have been at risk of dropping out. And sometimes the opposite dynamic can happen where those students are, are not getting, getting the opportunity in the way that was intended. So we wanted to really see who kind of helped the district look at who was actually enrolling and staying in these academies. Um, and we, so we found some really interesting things. Um, and as, as I mentioned, Elk Grove is a district where they have this long, uh, impressive history of offering um, high quality career academies. And so there was a good reputation sort of for those academies in the in the district that may have driven some of you know, what, you, what you'll see here. So one thing we found, we looked at uh, grade eight. So we looked at students before they made the decision to enroll in career academies or to do something else. And we found that these academy students on average had higher academic achievement. Um, they had higher um, GPAs. Um, they had progressed further in mathematics course sequences um, than other CTE students. Um, and the we talked in the focus groups with students to understand some of why this might have happened. Um, and one thing had to do with the way that you know with academies, you know the students were taking classes in a in a cohort schedule. And so if the student had um, had failed a class and had to make something up, um, that would really make it difficult for them to fit in the academy schedule to be able to do that. Um, so that's something we heard from students who wished that they could have come into the academy but weren't able to do it. Um, so that you know, there are just some some barriers that were in place. And you know, these academies don't uh, select students based on their GPA or their academic record. Um, if anything, I think they were really trying to sort of recruit a diverse group of students. But um, somehow these these kinds of barriers would would come up anyway for those with lower academic achievement. Um, we also saw that looking at students in eighth grade, um, those who chose the academy tended to um, be less likely to be socioeconomically disadvantaged, and they were more likely to have a parent who had some college education. And so some things that we heard from students and teachers and, and um, administrators um, had to do partly with the way that um, students and families would hear about the option of a career academy. So, you know, there are families where parents are working more than one job. Um, there might be a language barrier in, uh, with the parents. Um, the parent might have had past experiences that made them feel like school was not a place for them. Um, and that, so those families may have had more barriers to being able to sort of engage with the school and, and see the range of options that were available for their students. Um, so that was something that, uh, that sort of came forward as to why a student would be needed to make that enrollment choice might not be aware of it early enough. And I think perhaps related to this, um, we saw that the academy students were those who were um, less likely to have been, you know, sort of more chronically absent um, and less likely to have been suspended uh, than the students who, who did other, um, who, who made other choices. So again, it may have to do with kind of the engagement of the student. Um, with, with the school and sort of awareness, you know, if the student is in school and connected to school, they hear about deadlines, they connect with teachers. I mean, one thing we heard from students was that they, many of them had a teacher who, who suggested to them that they um, enroll in an academy. And uh, this is something that might be, um, you know, if, if a student had the time to, had kind of been able to build relationships with teachers, that that was maybe more likely to happen. Then there was another set of students who, again, had sort of uh, barriers related to scheduling in terms of being in that academy cohort set of classes. Um, so we found that students who were English learners or who had an individualized education program were, again, less likely to be um, enrolled in, an, in a career academy. Um, we heard from administrators that this really had a lot to do with um, just trying, if a student had to be in a particular 
service or class at a particular time, it became challenging for them to also participate in the set of, of career academy courses. Um, and there may have been some issues around sort of the language of instruction or some of some barriers of that nature as well. Um, we did hear from uh, at least one academy where um, they had made some particular efforts to recruit students with disabilities and that those students had had really positive experiences there. So I think there were examples, counter examples of where this could work really well. Um, and we also found interestingly that um, students who were reclassified English learners, so they had been English learners and they graduated from that program and were no longer in those, those classes, those students were actually more likely to be in the career academy. So that seemed like once they were um, out of that sort of more structured set of English learner services and courses that um, they were able to, to fully participate in academies. Um, so I wanted to just sort of to pause there and talk a little bit about sort of you know, if you're if this is an approach that you're interested in and kind of understanding like what are some ways that you could um, look at an academy that you're working with and kind of assess equity and how that's happening. Um, the approach that we took was really, you know, looking back. So looking before they make that choice of, of coming into the academy and seeing are you catching a, a, the full range of students. Um, if you look at their characteristics in that prior grade. Um, if you have the opportunity in the school you're working with or the district you're working with to actually have them build in some flags in their student information system, that can make this process a lot easier. Um, and then going beyond just the recruitment stage to also track students' progress and retention. So once they're in the program, are they are all different student groups progressing um, equitably and being well served by the program? Um, and so being able to compare that is really helpful. Um, particularly if, if counselors are, are able to access that data so that they can see kind of some of those patterns. And then, of course, you know, go past the numbers and talk with students and teachers and families to understand, you know, sort of what are the dynamics of what, why these things, these patterns might be happening. So I wanted to talk a, a little bit about um, some strategies for trying to promote greater equity and recruitment for career academies. Um, so these are examples I want to thank. Um, I think my colleague Sue Hubbard is is on the line. I want to thank her from Elk Grove. She helped. Uh, she and I have presented this information at, in other venues. Um, and so these are just ideas that or, or practices that Elk Grove has used. Um, we didn't study the e effectiveness of these particular practices as part of our study, um, but they are practices that. Uh, speak to barriers that we heard about in our focus groups and our conversations with teachers and students. So I thought it would be useful to share these um, with you here just as some examples. Um, one thing that Elk Grove has been doing is to draw on middle school career interest data to really do some targeted recruitment that allows them to kind of reach some students who that might not have known about the academies um, otherwise. So for example, they had um, students in let's say an engineering focused academy um, write letters to the rising eighth graders who had said, oh, I'm interested in engineering. So that allowed this kind of nice connection um, with the upperclassmen and also, um, you know, reaches into to sort of um, making sure that students know about the opportunity and that it's relevant to them. Um, another thing that that is to offer outreach to families in a way that they can access it. Um, so, you know, having different materials in different languages, having staff who can communicate in different languages, um, offering events and, and orientations at different times so that working parents can participate. Um, one thing that Elk Grove does is to have a really nice large community event called Map My Future, where they invite in the community and they have representatives from industry who are industry partners with the career academies and the other career programs and sort of bring in folk, you know, eighth graders and their families and other people along with current students so that they can really kind of get a get an open house kind of feeling to, for the, the, the programs that are offered. Um, and another technique was to try to create recruiting materials that make a really clear connection to college and career opportunities so that, you know, if there are families who kind of have this outdated idea of what um, career technical education is and they might not have thought of a career academy for their child, um, be able to share really concrete information about, you know, well, here's some occupations that are growing in our region and our academy is preparing a child for that for that career. Or here's a local um, college degree program that your your child could could be well prepared for if they participate in this um, career academy. And that gives really gives parents um, and students something more concrete to to sort of understand that that opportunity. Um, and I'll just briefly mention as well. Um, 
you know, as I mentioned, it's of course important for them to have a kind of a comprehensive approach to making sure that all students are welcome and supported through their time in the Career Academy. So, you know, some ways to do that include, you know, Elk Grove has really worked at trying to provide transportation to work-based learning activities that are taking place off campus, uh, because of course, a lot of students don't have a driver's license or access to a vehicle, or they may live in a place that's not well served by public transportation. Um, they've also worked on bringing work-based learning opportunities onto campus so that students don't have to leave and, you know, don't have that barrier to access. Um, another thought was to sort of work with offering um, opportunities to recover credit either during summer or after school so that students don't run into this issue that they have to retake algebra and therefore they can't take the career academy courses and so on. Um, and finally, just creating a sort of a cultural proficiency in the staff, you know, and having a bigger strategy more comprehensively to recruit a diverse staff and to have professional learning communities in which educators can really learn how to, to support all students. So I'm going to stop there. And um, Nick, I don't know if we've had questions in the chat that would be good for me to address at this point. Uh, yeah, are, yes. are you able to hear me at all? Sorry, I was, I was, the audio was a little scattered there. So I was trying to address that as well. Uh, I haven't seen any questions come in just yet, but let me Okay, good. We're getting feedback from YouTube saying the audio is fine. Good. Uh, let me start off with a with a quick question. Um, you so this section was really about who is enrolling in those career academies, and you really provided some great suggestions for how to make that process more equitable, especially for students of need. Um, and this is a really important topic for those of us in the NAF network um, that I wanted to dig into a little more deeply. Um, and, and maybe some of the folks on Elk Grove from Elk Grove can offer their insights as well. But I'm curious, did you hear of anything about um, the outreach to families and what they were doing to kind of innovate around that? Because I know that's something some of our academies have tried and specifically, you know, eighth grade summer camps or, you know, any kind of family night, parents night. I was wondering if you heard anything specifically that Elk Grove was doing in this domain that um, maybe they saw really good returns on and uh, really gauge, really uh, sparking that interest in middle Sure, school. and you know, I would encourage Sue, or if you or your colleagues want to jump in on the comments, um, you can certainly speak to this um, more effectively than I can. Um, so some things just to elaborate a little bit on a couple of practices that I mentioned earlier. Um, the, some of the outreach work that was happening, you know, they had things like larger events that like a, a, a annual um, community event where um, it really gave um, students and parents a chance to get a kind of hands-on feel for the kind of things that happened in the career academies. So, for example, you know, the you know, so all of the different career programs were invited um, and would kind of showcase what they what they were offering and they were you know there's a really nice um, emergency services fire and paramedics program um, so they would have a fire truck there and have folks from the you know their partners there who who work in those in that field were present um, kids could come eighth graders could come and kind of like hang out and see that you know talk with them and see the fire truck and learn about that field and what the what the academy was like. Um, so just as one small example of what would happen at, at that kind of event. Um, and that was something that really was sort of promoted in a way that made the community feel like this is our economy and that we're growing with our students and with our partners in the, the um, in the in the industry. Um, I know there was also just ongoing work that was really trying to communicate with families about and with working with making sure that teachers and counselors um, have the tools to really talk with students about what these opportunities are. So. Um, like I was saying, sort of having info sheets that are like, here's some information about occupations that you could pursue out related to this career field. Here are college programs related to this. Um, and then having also a list of like, here's what the classes are that you could take that would count towards this particular um, pathway for a career. Um, so those are just some things that I, I know I had heard from folks at Elk Grove that they were trying. Um, and, you know, as you know, I think as Sue mentioned, you know, in the chat that, you know, the Map Your Future event is regional. And, you know, there's been a lot of work in the Elk Grove is, is located near Sacramento. And I know the greater sort of Elk Grove and Sacramento region has done a lot of work around um, kind of building regional partnership with uh, community, both with higher ed and with employers and with other community players. 
and with the schools to really um, kind of bring together support that is a way to kind of make this a community endeavor. Great, thank you. Um, um, and oh, and I'll just mention also, I think Sue, that um, as part of that sort of outreach that uh, I think Sue was mentioning this in the chat that they have a really nice ambassador program for students who are currently in a career academy and that they kind of represent the program. So it's a great learning opportunity for that student to have that chance to kind of speak, you know, to community members or to visitors to the school or to middle schools. Um, and so those ambassadors, ambassadors for the program can like go and visit the middle school and give a talk to the, the eighth graders. And so that gives those younger students a sense of, oh, wow, that could be me doing that. Great, great. We have, we have another question from Kate Hayden, who's one of our portfolio managers. Um, you may or may not be able to speak to this, Catherine, but maybe Susan could if, if you can't. But her question is, how much, does Elk, how much do Elk Grove Academies assist with keeping middle school students on track and catch those students ahead of falling behind? You know, that is a great question. I, I can't speak to that. We didn't, that's not something that we looked at um, or talked about, but I think that, um, Perhaps Sue can can respond to that in the comments. But that, yeah, that, that's critical, I would say. Okay. Good. Um, well, do, what do you think, Nick? Should I head on to the next section, or um, anything else that you'd like me to to address before I go on? Um, I think. I think maybe I have one more question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, sure. As you know, the um, the NAF uh, Research and Tech Department, along with the Network Development Team, who Kate Hayden is on that team as well, as well as many other great individuals, uh, we work with our academies to implement a quality review process mm -hmm. to really facilitate that continuous improvement, you know, year out, year in, each academy getting better. And one of the items on that review rubric centers around student recruitment and enrollment, mm -hmm. um, but we really only ensure on that rubric that we're, that the academies are having an open enrollment policy in place as part of mm -hmm. that equitable access. Um, just based on um, some of the things maybe Elk Grove is doing or some of the things you've heard about, um, should there be other, should there be other components that, you know, could potentially be included in, in something like that beyond just uh, like an open enrollment policy? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, yeah, you know, there could be some standards like sort of, you know, our, um, our recruitment materials available in the main language, the main languages for your district. Um, are there, I, I know one thing that we talked about with administrators in Elk Grove, they said that although they had, uh, they had an open enrollment policy, but the application for some of the career academies still had a place for GPA. And that was just, they were really using it more to just say, oh, did we get a diverse, you know, who is this student? What are they, where are they coming from? Um, and not as a screening tool, um, but just the presence of GPA on the application was something that was actually seemed to be creating a perception among students about who was welcome in the academy or not. So they took that out. They removed that from the, um, from the application. And I think doing that sort of deeper dive of making sure that not only do you have a policy on paper, but does that policy play out in the way that counselors talk to students and what's the sort of image of the, the way that the recruitment happens, um, I think is important. Um, I think for in terms of a quality standard or measure that you could look at, I think doing some tracking of whether the retention rates and participation rates match up with the demographics of your district um, would be important. Um, I know not just Elk Grove, but in, you know, a lot of California career academies are funded. We're, fun, we're funded through the uh, particular um, part, you know, partnership trust mechanism for community uh, California partnership academies, and that they had a requirement about sort of how many students needed to have certain characteristics that are, might have historically placed them at risk. So, be able to track some pieces like that to make sure that you're meeting those targets um, would be a good thing to review as well. Definitely, definitely. Okay. It doesn't look like any other questions are coming in on this particular piece. So yeah, feel free to feel free to take it away. And if there if there are audio issues for folks in the audience, uh, let me know in the chat because I guess sometimes I could be hearing something else than is what it than what's actually going through. Great. And Nick, definitely let me know if I need to slow down or repeat something about. I'm sorry, I wasn't aware there were audio issues. That's okay. It it doesn't seem like it was going through to YouTube the issues, okay. so it was strictly on my end. So that's good. good. 
Good. So I want to turn now to um, kind of the main research question that we looked at with this particular study, um, which was to try to understand whether um, career academy students have different academic outcomes uh, than other CTE students. Um, and so just to kind of go back a bit to what I mentioned earlier, you know, we will, really were trying to kind of tease out like what might make an academy special and different um, as an experience from other just CTE education more broadly. Um, and I I know that academies can be defined in very different ways, and NAF has its standards for what constitutes a high quality academy. Um, for the purpose of this study, we really looked at three core components of an, a career academy. One was that the students have a peer cohort and that they are taking, ideally, they're taking most of their core academic classes as well as their CTE sequence of technical classes together and doing that moving from year to year together with those with those courses. So that's a peer cohort and a, a relationships with a group of teachers as well. So one was a cohort, um, two was uh, that the there is some degree of um, integration of the academic and the technical curricula. And the third major thing being work-based learning experiences. So there's access to um, whether it's internships or student-led enterprises uh, or more kind of exploration level uh, work-based learning around um, job shadowing or you know sort of learning about just exposure to different careers. Um, so those were kind of the main things that we thought about that distinguish a, a career academy experience from uh, just taking a sequence of courses. Um, so the way we looked at a few different outcomes uh, through the study, um, we looked at persistence through a CTE course sequence. So um, if there are three courses in the culinary sequence, um, you know, did you, we, and we particularly looked at whether students attained concentrator status to use the Perkins terminology, like did they complete two, at least two of the courses in that sequence, um, or did they go on and complete three? Um, we also looked at some kind of basic broader academic measures. So we looked at um, standardized test scores in mathematics and English language arts that students took in grade 11. Um, we also looked at students' GPA and then separately at um, the GPA that they earned within uh, CTE classes. And we looked at that after, uh, after three, three years after the student had started their CTE experience. Uh, we looked at high school graduation rates and we looked at uh, college enrollment rates. So those are the, the outcomes that we just, that we were looking at. Um, and then with the qualitative work and the focus groups and interviews, we tried to understand more about what aspects of the students' experiences in career academies uh, might account for any difference or lack of difference that we saw um, in those outcomes. Um, so in terms of the methods we used to, to answer that question um, for the quantitative side, um, so for those of you who joined the previous talk in this series with Sean Doherty, he talked a bit about the way there's different levels of evidence that you can generate through research, um, and that a really strong type of evidence comes from using a randomized experiment. So you have a lottery and you have students are, are assigned randomly to be in the, in the academy or not. Um, and that, that way, you're, you can be really confident that if you see a difference in outcomes between the student who's in the academy and the student who's not, um, you can be pretty confident that that's because of their academy experience um, and not because of all of the other things that might lead a student to choose to enroll in an academy that might also affect their later outcomes. Um, so in a lot of situations, of course, as you know, it's very hard to do a randomized experiment. Um, so there's other techniques that we try to use that at least try to approximate or approach um, that kind of um, ability to say something about student outcomes. Um, and the approach that we chose here was is called propensity score matching. And essentially what we did, uh, you know, as you know, as you saw, you know, with the previous piece of my talk, um, the students who chose the career academy did look different from the students who did not make that choice. Um, so what we did is to take their eighth grade characteristics and try to find a group of comparison students who did not enroll in the academy, but they were similar to those academy students. So statistically, the two groups were, were equivalent or close to equivalent. Um, now that doesn't completely account for all the reasons that a student might join an academy. Um, and we didn't have data on something like motivation or maybe a student has a parent who's especially engaged or the student has a special career interest. You know, there's a lot of pieces that you don't, you're not able to control for that could be um, kind of muddying the waters of, of what we learn. Um, but at least it gets you a little bit closer to being able to say something more definitive about outcomes. 
Um, so through this match group, you know, remember I said we had about 3,600 students in the cohort to start with. Um, but after doing this matching process, that got us down to 1,300 total students who were in these two kind of similar groups. Um, so then we analyzed the relationship between for that group between the academy enrollment and, and um, the different outcomes, concentrator status and other outcomes. So in terms of um, sort of what we found uh, for persistence through a CTE course sequence, um, so the students within the academy were much more likely to persist to two or to three courses. Um, as you can see from the, this is just the, the descriptive data for that group of 1,300 students, but um, you know, 88% of them uh, attained at least concentrator status of you know, two or three courses within the sequence. Um, and 39% of the non-academy students did that. Um, so some of this is really just telling you that, you know, of course, the, the academy has a structure. If you join the academy, there's an expectation that you would continue in that course sequence. Um, so partly, this is not a surprising thing to see. And it's telling you that the academy is doing its job of kind of giving students a track and keeping them on track. Um, but it does show that, that that was happening within that group, that something about that structure and expectation was um, doing something different from what students would get if they were taking CTE classes, but without the sort of bigger pieces around it of the cohort and the work-based learning experiences and integrated curriculum. Um, we also looked at these other academic um, effects. Um, and what we found is we really, there was very little or no effect um, on high school academic outcomes for the academy students compared to the non-academy CTE students. Um, so we did see some small positive differences in terms of academy students having slightly higher average um, standardized test scores in both English and math. Um, the, the, diff the size that I'm showing here, if you're familiar with the term effect size, um, it basically is what I'm showing here is like 8% of a standard deviation. Or if you think about one of these uh, standardized tests, um, it's like eight points on a scale score. So it just is, it's a pretty small effect. Um, and again, it could be still something that's due to some of those unmeasured differences that we weren't really able to control for between the two groups. So our sense of it was that this was kind of a, a very small difference that we saw there. Um, and then for GPA and also for CTE GPA, there was no significant, statistically significant difference for academy versus non-academy students. Um, and then similarly, looking at sort of measures of attainment, uh, the difference in rate for high school graduation and for college enrollment was less than 1%, 1 percentage point difference. So again, there was really no statistically significant or practically significant um, effect on those, those outcomes for this particular group. Keeping in mind that this is looking at academy students and other CTE students um, that we're comparing. Um, so why did we find these kind of limited effects of, of uh, on these academic um, outcomes? Um, so one thing that we heard from the focus groups from both students and teachers, um, although, although there were was creative work happening around integrating the academic piece and the technical piece, um, there wasn't as much common planning time as teachers would have liked. Um, and so it just made it very difficult to do more kind of in-depth uh, integrated work. And one of the theories about why you might see um, sort of an improvement in academic effects for um, an academy student might be that kind of that, that that academic curricula has this kind of relevance and contextualization that happens with, um, you know, putting it together with the technical piece. Um, so if it's hard for that to happen in a, a richer way, um, that might mean that it, it's not really quite as possible for that to happen. Um, there were academies where, uh, that we heard about where students were, where, where teachers were in fact putting together um, a much more um, kind of in-depth project uh, over the year, working with an industry partner and working on a, a real industry problem that the employer brought to them um, and kind of bringing together things like their math and their physics skills together with their, let's say, engineering or construction skills. So that was happening sometimes, but more commonly, um, teachers were doing things that were a little bit more limited in terms of making the connections. Um, so that may have been one piece of, of what happened there. Um, the other thing is that you know these are not, there were 17 academies I think in this in this study, and they were quite different in the way that they were implemented. Um, so some we did do a little bit of a, a deeper dive um, into some of the larger academies to try to look at that, like what was happening in that academy 
Um, and, you know, and so we were able to see that at least for one kind of STEM focused academy, um, there were some positive effects on math scores um, compared to other CTE students. Um, and then in other academies, we just saw like the same sort of non effect. So it seemed like there was just variation in kind of how how these different programs are implemented and that that may have you know, that may have just kind of washed out in some ways um, in terms of looking at an overall effect. So it would be great. One thing that we would love to do more further work on is to understand more about, you know, measuring kind of the degree of these different pieces that are happening, how much integration of, of curriculum is happening or how much, um, how much work-based learning is happening and so on, and try to sort of look at that as another way to understand where, where might we see um, differences with, uh, with effects. Um, I'll also mention just for context that, you know, there are studies that have found impacts on high school graduation rates and college enrollment rates, especially for sometimes or especially related to for male students or for lower income students. Um, there have not been a lot of studies that found a connection, you know, for test score differences. Um, and that so some of that is in a way what you might expect because, um, you know, you want your career academy students to at least be on a par with with other students. Um, so that might not be totally surprising to see that. Um, but anyway, be that as it may, um, these are some of the sort of reasons that we thought that we might have seen limited effects here. So we also talked with students and teachers about what they saw as you know, effects that might not be captured in the quantitative data. Um, and I just want to talk about one small tweak to kind of the groups that we looked at here. So for the focus groups, um, we talked to students in the academy, and then we talked to students who were in the same occupational pathway. Um, so they're, they're really the only difference with those students, you know, they might be t all taking culinary courses, but only the academy students were in the peer cohort and getting the work ex extra work-based learning and so on. So when we looked at, at this kind of head-to-head -head comparison through the, the focus groups, um, academy students felt like they were, they described sort of gaining um, non-academic skills, um, like responsibility and um, collaboration skills. And so some of, you know, what we heard from them about this, um, they really attributed a lot of that to kind of being part of the cohort um, and like having a sense of identity as being part of this academy. Um, they felt like teachers, their perception as academy students was that they were special, um, that they were given extra responsibility. Like, you know, we're allowed to use this expensive equipment unsupervised because we're trustworthy. Um, we're, you know, we're allowed to sort of run the student leadership organization and manage funds for certain, certain academy um, activities or for a student enterprise. Um, so those were things that really the students saw as kind of giving them this sense of, um, a chance to kind of grow some of those skills in terms of, of responsibility um, and ownership of their own sort of growth and work. Um, and they felt also that they were able to kind of grow their collaboration skills. So those students talked a lot, and I'm sure you've probably seen this, you know, in your own work, in your settings, um, that students have all of this time where they are, you know, they go out and they do videography for the football game, you know, with the other kids from the media academy, or they go to, you know, do sort of a, a, they cater a culinary event um, at the, on campus. Um, you know, so they have all these time, all this time that they're spending with the work-based learning experiences where they are doing work together with other students in their academy. Um, also having kind of common classes together was something they talked about that, you know, I can go get help with my math homework from the same group of students that I'm getting help with, you know, with my technical classes. Um, so those kind of feelings of, you know, being put together with students who they might not have otherwise um, really hung out with, um, they would talk, they articulated that that was sort of something where they learned skills of like, how do I kind of work with these different folks who I, I they weren't my friends when I started into this, but, you know, when I sort of had had time with, with this cohort, um, it really developed my skills for actually understanding how to work with different people. Um, and one thing that we found that was interesting, um, you know, Elk Grove makes an effort to to create um, a peer cohort schedule. I mean, ideally, the students are taking a set of core academic and technical classes together, and they progress through that, you know, through the years of the academy. Um, but it's not pure cohorting. Um, there, you know, there's always issues with um, students who need to take an advanced placement class, or they have other conflicts, you know, with their schedules. And so that it's not. Um, I think it varied from school to school to some degree, but it was not um, 
you know, it's sort of like a pure cohort experience, but this, these kinds of connections that students talked about developing um, seem to be happening anyway through the, the types of sort of pure connections that they did have through the common classes that they did have and the common experiences that they did have. And a lot of that also had to do with sort of, it really created a sense of family and belonging um, within the, the peer cohort and with the teachers. Um, there was a lot of language around sort of, we are a family, um, we're being, the teachers are sort of parental figures in certain ways or caring adults that they could count on, um, as well as sort of the connections to their peers. Um, as we know from other research, you know, having that sense of belonging is a really important support for student persi students' persistence. Um, and we think may have may have been one of the reasons that students were staying in the academy and staying through that sequence of CTE courses um, that we saw. So teachers also talked about the cohort as being really important for um, kind of being able to do information sharing among the teachers. So both sharing, you know, positive successes and and challenges that students were having and making sure that a student didn't slip through the cracks. So uh, if there was something going on with a student in the math class, then they could give a heads up to the, um, you know, building trades teacher and kind of kind of make sure that the student had more than one pair of eyes on them and, and helping them out um, as they went through their day. Um, and the other piece around the sort of the ac academy cohort, um, teachers and students talked about um, the way that it kind of creates guardrails. So it's like there's an expectation that you're going to work through this particular sequence of courses and do these activities. Um, and for some students, this was really helpful because it kind of gave them a next step and they didn't they didn't have to kind of forge their own path quite so much. Um, so of course, as you know, students need different things, different models work for different, different young people. Um, but for a student who maybe was a bit in the middle and you know not quite sure what they wanted to do, um, this seemed like a really helpful feature that there's kind of an expected structure and a, a group that's going in this direction and you can go with that group um, and it kind of helps you keep on track. So I'm going to close this section again with just a few things that we heard um, from our partners in Elk Grove about what they what they saw as ways, you know, practices that kind of strengthen that cohort experience. So beyond just having the, the block, you know, the scheduling, that's very hard to implement. There are sort of these other pieces that were kind of a glue that was creating some of these connections. Um, so we heard a lot. So they were, they really looked at um, developing student leadership organizations, uh, making sure that uh, students had opportunities for responsibilities. You know, they were running fundraisers, managing budgets, doing communications campaigns. Um, so sort of being given that, that responsibility was something that, that seemed to help um, both develop their skills and also give them a chance to build relationships with other students. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but doing the outreach to middle schools and being part of the student ambassador program um, to the broader community was really a, a way to both build skills and to build connections to their peer cohort. Um, and then some things that we heard from uh, our partners in Elk Grove about sort of the ways that they tried to do, make some connections between the technical and the academic, even if it was not sort of the most full-blown ideal model of that. Um, on a simple level, teachers talked about, you know, we picked a theme for this year and um, all of the, the classes that were related to the academy, we all had something related to that theme um, in terms of our activities, or they used kind of agreed on some common terminology that people were gonna learn and use, you know, across the different classes. Um, some of the academies that had a little bit, bit more common planning time or ability to do some work together um, would adopt a common grading rubric. So if you have that same rubric for projects, then um, teachers ideally can then also review the uh, rubrics together. Uh, so um, in the academic class and the technical class and kind of find some common areas of like strength and need for improvement. So if you see across all these classes where students really need to work on their oral presentation skills, great. You know, you can kind of have a common strategy for, for addressing some, doing some diagnostics and doing some addressing of those, those things. Um, and then finally, just as a, a simple thing that, that classes could do, um, was to set common expectations for the behavior, behaviors and norms in the classrooms. So you know when you walk into one of your academy classes, this is what's expected of you, and it will be the same with, um, you know, with your culinary classes. It will be with your with your um, economics class. So I'm going to pause there and again open it up for questions. And Nick, you can let me know if we've got folks uh, if folks had any questions there. 
Yeah, um, there was there was one question from Gene Friedman uh, about the nature of the academy students. Can you redefine um, what what you called again an academy student versus just a someone who took a CTE uh, course? And correct me if I'm wrong, but there weren't any NAF students in this study, were there? No, yeah, there there are not any NAF academies in um, in Elk Grove. So the, these were uh, California has funded what are called California Partnership Academies. So that was one of the types or models of funding for them. Um, and then there were some that were funded in other ways. And I think Sue could also jump in in the chat about sort of some of the different sort of flavors of, of academy. Um, but in terms of like how we defined an academy and what we considered that what made the experience an academy. Um, there were sort of three core things that we looked at. Um, one was that they have a peer, that they have a cohort. So this, these students are taking um, a set of their core academic classes and their CTE pathway technical classes together. So it might not be all of those classes, but at least many of the classes they're going to be during their day together with the same group of students. You know, they would have, you know, regular math and you know, they would have culinary math you know with the other culinary students so there would be sort of a, a relevant curriculum around that um, and the same students would be in the class with them and then they would go into culinary class and work on the, the culinary skills um, so related to that peer cohort that moves together then also um, having some degree of integrated academic technical curriculum and as i was just mentioning that sort of ran the gamut it wasn't always like highly integrated but there were efforts to do kind of contextualization of, of, of uh, academic classes um, and then work-based learning is the other piece. So these were all, all of these academies were offering um, different types of work-based learning and many of them like pretty um, sort of on the continuum of the intensity and richness of the experience you could have, you know, they're doing things like running a student enterprise or, um, or, or doing, you know, internships or having work experiences that were paid. Yeah, feel free uh, audience members to ask any additional questions for Dr. Shield. Um, while you're formulating those questions, I have I have a quick question too. It was really interesting to hear that the academy students at Elk Grove didn't differ from those non-academy students on kind of those standard academic metrics. Um, and that's mm -hmm. also reported elsewhere in the literature. So this this was no by no means un unique to that. You, you mentioned that. Um, but you mentioned that academy students really gained those non-academic skills, like you highlighted responsibility and collaboration skills and really learning uh, or being part of that small learning community. And I, I can only speak from my experience, but that's something I've really noticed with some of the NAF students as well, you know, that very tight knit community where they're looking out for each other. So um, what, can, what can practitioners and researchers do to really highlight some of those important aspects that um, you know, a lot of times when you're asking about, well, does this affect X, Y, and Z, a lot of people may only be talking about those standard um, academic outcomes. But what can we do to really kind of highlight the importance of these these other aspects of career academies, like a small learning community, like, you know, responsibility and time management and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. No, I think there's there's different things we could do there. And w one thing I, that I would, I think would be important for future research is to really try to measure some of those things in a way that can be generalized, you know, beyond just sort of anecdotal information, which is useful, but, you know, to really have either structured qualitative work where you have a sort of focus groups with a large number, um, where you have a chance to kind of synth synthesize across a large number of students at different academies to, to kind of generate some good evidence that way, um, or um, having quantitative survey measures um, that try to capture some of those those types of non-academic skills. Um, you know, and those, those methods have their limitations, but, you know, a, a well-done survey could really help you kind of measure, do, do students in fact have a different level of, um, you know, collaboration skills when they start or when and when they finish. Um, you could also do, you know, I think classroom observations would be a really nice way to try to, to gather sort of more structured data around that kind of thing to really communicate or to see, are we in fact, these things that we're hearing in these focus groups, is that something that plays out when you look at a larger sample um, in different academies? Um, so, so I think that would be a good way to sort of, would be important information to gather and understand better in the field. Um, and I think, you know, just ha highlighting, I think having, it was always really powerful to listen to students kind of describe this themselves and sort of what their experiences were in terms of 
um, what they gain from kind of being in a peer cohort and explaining kind of having teachers and students talk about the way that they saw that playing out, um, I think was was very helpful for us. And I don't know if I have other, um, some of my team members may, from our study team may be in the, on the call as well. They're, I welcome your joining in on the chat uh, with any other thoughts about that too. You, uh, you had mentioned before too that some other um, academy, career academy research has shown you know, benefits for students of certain gender, ethnicity. I imagine you tried to look at those kinds of things as well, but you didn't, you didn't find any of those different breakdowns at all. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, yeah, we did look at that to see if this, if there was a different effect of being in an academy for students based on a number of different characteristics. Like, did it matter if you uh, were male or female? Did it matter if there were different race, race and ethnicity characteristics? Um, prior academic level. We did actually look at that for each of those outcomes and we did not find that there was a difference in the effect. So or sort of the, the lack of effect yeah. was the same <laughs> for different groups. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, fi I figured you had done that. I just wanted to double check. No, yeah, uh, I should have mentioned that, yeah. Any other, any questions from uh, from the audience or anything else you'd like to, you'd like to talk about, Catherine, either related to you know, next steps for your for your future research or anything else in the pipeline? Sure. Well, one thing that we're uh, spending our, our energy on now is to, um, as I mentioned, diving kind of more deeply into work-based learning and what the experiences are that students are having. So as you know, that work-based learning can run the gamut from, you know, a, a speaker comes to your class and tells you about, uh, you know, agricultural engineering careers, or you can, you know, do a workshop where you learn um, specific techniques within agricultural engineering, and then you get a paid work experience at the end of that. So there's kind of that whole range or continuum between sort of awareness and exploration up to training and, and practice. Um, so we have been working closely with Elk Grove to develop tools to gather information about individual students' participation in work-based learning. So what are they doing? How many hours are they spending on it? Um, and then really trying to get a complete picture of what the intensity sort of the intensity and type of experience that students are having with work-based learning. And then we're going to look at that in terms of kind of the variation we see as, across the, the different academies and schools um, and also see if there are differences, again, looking at these some of these access questions, you know, who actually is getting these opportunities and is that equitable or not? And what we'll also be collecting qualitative data as well as we did um, with this previous piece, but, um, you know, doing focus groups with students and teachers to understand what, what's going on behind the, the data. So that's been a really nice partnership and we're uh, aiming to develop a toolkit for other districts that would like to do this um, to kind of a set of tools that would help you to gather this kind of information and use it. Because I know in California, it's becoming a part of accountability systems to indicate that students have participated in work-based learning. I know that's happening in other states as well. So um, this, we thought that that would be timely, timely stuff to work on. Yeah, definitely. We're we're doing a bit of that ourselves, and it'd be interesting when you when you have finalized that toolkit uh, to make it readily available because we would love to share that information out because um, it's really a balance, right? You don't want to you don't want to be asking for too much because teachers are already overworked, especially in the virtual environment. They have more than enough to do. So I'd, mm -hmm. I'd be really interested in when those products do come out, if we could disseminate them to some of our, some of the teachers in our network as well. So they could, they could see what other folks are thinking about on that front. Yeah, I'd be very happy to come back and talk with, with your group um, when we have those products available and they will definitely be available to everybody. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think it's just a piece that a lot of folks are we're trying to figure out a balance and use tools like um, one of the things we're using with Elk Grove is, you know, barcode scanners that you can use with student IDs. So you can just like set it up and zap the students when they come in um, or things with the mobile app that the student can put in. OK, I did my internship hours and they self-report it. So we're trying to be creative and not have it just be that there's some poor teacher who's spending hours and hours with an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> so right. it, it's hard, though. It's tricky. Yeah. That's great. The, the 21st century has arrived. That's that's actually really cool to hear with the, the barcodes and the phone app. Um, yeah. I want to be mindful of, of everyone's time. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to end us here. Um, thank you again, Dr. Shields, for your time today and for all of your insights. Um, 
I think I can speak for everyone who is attending today that we're really thrilled about your research and really looking forward to what comes next. Um, I'm sorry, you, you had your information up there, but I took it off. Uh, so if anyone from the audience, I'll put it back. Oh, there. thanks, yeah. If anyone from the audience wants to follow Dr. Catherine Shields and what she's doing, or you have any questions after the talk, please feel free to reach out to her here. Uh, she and I discussed previously, she's not on Twitter yet, but she might be working on that uh, a little bit here in the future. Um, so again, is, is there anything, um, any parting words you'd like to say, Dr. Shields, before we end the stream here? Uh, no, just, you know, I really appreciate the great work that everybody's doing, especially in a really challenging year like this one. And, um, you know, I look forward to talking with you again at some point in the future and hearing more about what you're all doing too. Great. Um, thank you again, Dr. Shields. Um, keep an eye out for the folks in the audience. We do have another, the, our next research and tech talk is scheduled for sometime in October, maybe early November. So it's not crystallized yet, but keep an eye out on your emails for um, some future details and an RSVP link as well. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we hope everyone is staying safe and doing well and the back to school season is going as well as it can. Um, so stay safe out there and uh, We'll see you next time. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, everyone.